Oh, uh, hello there. Um, forgive my current sleeping arrangements, it's been a crazy couple of weeks. My name's Connor Long, and in the before time, I was a veterinary student. I built an enriched bioactive enclosure for my pet ball python, and I put up a video of it on YouTube, and I got a few requests from viewers to discuss in a little bit more detail how I built it and uh, what type of plants and lighting and whatnot I used. So I figured I'd take this opportunity to go into uh, a few of the specifications about the enclosure. So Ollie LeVay asks, uh, do you have a time lapse of, of building this enclosure? Well, Ollie, I, I actually did have a time lapse, but I had to trade all of the footage for toilet paper. So I don't have that anymore, but I do have a few um, still images that I took while building it that I can I can put up to maybe give you guys a general idea of how I put it together. Uh, I will also link to a couple videos down in the description. Um, that show how to build this type of setup if you're looking for a more specific tutorial. Megan Rude asks, I need to know what it's lined with. I suppose we could be talking about substrate or we could be talking about uh, how, how I waterproofed it to make a drainage layer. Um, Dave Brunner did ask, uh, how have you mixed the substrate? And it looks like a user known as Heho asked, um, how was it waterproofed? So I'll go ahead and explain um, all of those. So to, to waterproof the enclosure, because it is made out of plywood, I used a dry lock. Dry lock is a material that you can use. Um, you can actually use it to make plywood aquariums, though some aquarists, it looks like, will say it, it, it's not as durable as something like epoxy. Uh, in terms of water resistance for a terrestrial setup, I think it worked really well. Um, I used the dry lock to seal it, and then I used a rubber pond liner on top of the dry lock to make sure that the bottom was like an integrated tray. So it's, it's certainly waterproof down at the bottom. It was a bit of a roundabout way to do it. Uh, it'll work if you want to do that. It, they were materials that I was familiar with and were, were within my budget. I would actually recommend going with an epoxy or a paint-on pond liner. Um, Tanner over at Serpa Design has a good explanation of how to use the epoxy, and the king of DIY, uh, who builds a lot of aquariums, he has an explanation of how to use the other method with the kind of paint-on pond liner. So I will link both of those down in the description. I would recommend you go with one of those methods just because they seem a little bit less roundabout. All right, so in terms of substrate, what I'm using here is just regular cypress mulch, and that is sitting on top of a section of pond liner that I cut out in order to make sure that the actual growing media that I keep the, the plants in was separate from the uh, layer that the snake would be coming into contact with most frequently because I did not want him to be uh, perpetually sitting in wet or moist substrate. That can be bad for their skin. So. In the back there, it's covered up in cypress. In the front, it's covered up in leaf litter. Uh, the front stays a bit more moist, but that's okay. I'm not that worried about that as long as the snake has the ability to choose between moist and dry. The substrate I'm using to grow the plants in that's underneath the, the pond liner and the cypress is the Serpa Design Tropical Mix. I will link how to make that below. It's worked really well for me so far. Dave Brunner also asks, uh, nice vivarium, thank you. Flammable sign, flammable sign, flammable sign. Uh, what's the temp in the Viv? Does it match what your ball python needs 30 asterisks and the plant? Uh, I think I think he means 30 degrees. Um, that's probably in Celsius. All of the temperatures are the appropriate uh, temperature for the ball python. I'll go into a bit more detail about that. The plants do okay. Um, they are not all the best suited for this type of enclosure. I'll explain that a bit too. So in terms of our temperature guidelines for ball pythons, really what we're trying to get for ambient temperature is somewhere between uh, 77 and 86 degrees. And then we can go down as low as about uh, 72 and as high as about 95 in the basking area. So let's see if all spots in the cage where the python's going to be frequenting uh, meets that range.
Inside, we'll see in the basking area, we're getting about 88-ish. Uh, it's gonna be warmer in the back left because the heating element is right below the upper hide. So actually the upper hide stays uh, warmer than the, the lower hide. And that's on a thermostat. So that controls the back left of that hide should be in the 90s. Um, and the thermostat says it's 96 right now. It's probably a bit low. <coughs> Chris asks, what humidity levels do you keep it at? Uh, what plants have worked well for you? I'll talk about humidity levels first, Chris, and then um, we'll go into plants a little bit uh, after that. So for humidity levels for a ball python, you want to be between 50 and 80%. And this enclosure does stay 50 to 80% most of the time. Uh, sometimes during the day, like the middle of the day when it gets warm, it might dip into the 40s. but um, at nighttime, it's above 50, and most of the day, it's above 50 as well. I do mist it with a pump-up mister once a day as well to keep that humidity up. And the snake can also go into his pool if he would like to soak. James Damien says, all the plants are doing so well. What is the lighting? Uh, great question. Lighting for vivariums is one of the more complicated aspects. Uh, it was confusing for me when I got started. I'll do a brief overview about it right now. All right, so the issue with lighting this setup is that it is tall. It's a little over three feet tall. And so as you get farther down into a large terrarium, it becomes more difficult to get uh, the light to penetrate. This is due to the inverse square law. New England Herpticulture has a really good article on that. I believe it's called Vibarium Lighting 101. I'd recommend that you check it out. Um, I'm not gonna discuss it that much here, uh, maybe in a future video, but the takeaway is essentially that I, I have these two bright LED panels that I got off of Amazon and they work pretty well for plants that are pretty close but in order to light the understory I really need these focused floodlights as well. They're regular floodlights um, that I got at my local hardware store and they have a 60 degree beam angle that focuses that light. So we're gonna take a uh, lux meter to measure the foot candles right now. And foot candles are the a unit of light that is often used in horticulture. This isn't the best uh, piece of equipment, but it works okay for our purposes. So we can see that down at the bottom, right now we're at about 100 foot candles. At the very top of the enclosure, we're a little under 1400. Middle of the enclosure is gonna be sitting in the 300s roughly. We got 390, 270. And then back at the bottom, which we just saw is about 100. So that light really drops off pretty quickly. What a beautiful terrarium. Is it possible to list the plants that you used in the in the setup? Uh, yeah, of course. And uh, going back to what Chris, Chris wanted to know, he also wanted to know the type of plants. So I'll go ahead and um, link to all the different types of plants right now. All right, so here are all of the plants that I used in the setup. I do want to give special mention to my top four favorites, and those are Pothos, Creeping Fig, Neorogelia bromeliads, and uh, Baby Tears. And the reason I like these four is that they are all fast growing. They are relatively uh, robust, both in their growing conditions and in the fact that they can stand to be crawled on by a large bodied snake without getting totally crushed. And uh, they, they work really well for specific functions. The pothos provides good overall cover for the snake to hide in. The creeping fig climbs up well along the backdrop. The neorogelia bromeliads can add a splash of color to the background, which I really like, and, and they're pretty easy to attach and then the baby tears make good ground cover. So those are my top four favorites. Uh, I originally built this enclosure wanting to showcase a Monstera, and I still have Monstera, but it's just not growing quite as well as the Pothos. And so if I was to do it again, I would probably use these four plants as my sort of main staples and then use the other plants as more accent pieces. Right now I have a couple bare spots in the cage in the bottom right and up on the uh, top hide. And those are bare because the plants that I was planning to uh, have grow there turned out to not be as hardy as I thought that they would be. And um, I'm in the process of replacing them with uh, either the creeping fig or the pothos. 
Despite the fact that not all of these plants have grown as well as I hoped that they would, I do enjoy all of them. I'm glad that I uh, tried such a wide variety, and I'm particularly fond of my Nepenthes and my Butterworts, which are two carnivorous plants that I have, actually two different species of Butterworts. And they're pretty cool because they will actually catch little fungus gnats and bugs that get into the enclosure that I don't want there, so they provide a nice function as well as looking cool. In any case, I'll leave you to the rest of the list. Alright, and so that's the enclosure, and I um, hope that, you know, this can maybe give some... Um, yeah, what? What's up? Hey, Connor. We, we need some toilet paper. We're coming in, okay? Okay. I, I, need, it. I need it for the you video. We can't the have paper all the, the toilet video. paper for the video. And I don't think you should have this.